Um, and I hope uh, we have a pretty good show here tonight. Uh, so joining us in the studio tonight, we got some of my regulars uh, back in the house. Uh, she missed out on us last week, but she's back tonight. Miss Monica, how you doing tonight, Miss Monica? Good. How you doing, Jay Will? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Miss um, McCray has also been gone for a couple of weeks, but she's back tonight. How you doing, Miss McCray? What's happening, family? Happy to be here. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, back in the building here, we have uh, Micah, Mr. Micah King. He's back for us. How you doing tonight, Mike? I'm doing great, brother. Real. All right, and uh, behind the boards over there, we have Jeremy. Jeremy, as always, how you doing, Jeremy? What's going on, everybody? Oh, uh, and uh, we have a guest tonight. We have a guest tonight. We um, brought in uh, a lawyer friend of mine. We're going to be talking uh, tonight about the Trayvon Martin case. Uh, so I brought a lawyer friend of mine to uh, give us some legal perspective on the issue, uh, Mr. Rob Horst. How you doing, Rob? Not bad, Jim. How you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing here. pretty good. Glad to have you here tonight. Uh, so like I said, uh, tonight uh, we're going to get into uh, the legal aspect of the Trayvon Martin case now that we officially have a charge on the table. Uh, so we'll see uh, and talk about that. Uh, but before we get there, uh, a lot of things happening in the news over the past week. So one thing I want to address in particular, um, it is, as far as I'm concerned, official. Uh, Mitt Romney will be the Republican uh, presidential candidate. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> we finally have we finally have a competitor <laughs> not officially technically it's not official yet uh but uh it is unofficial uh it is not expected that any of the remaining candidates to uh step over step up i should say and challenge him and so uh, we officially have a candidate uh in the building and uh it looks like it's going to be a dog fight uh, from all indication uh pretty much all of the polls that they've been releasing now that uh you know, unofficially, Mitt Romney will be the candidate. Um, it's pretty much looking like a, a dead heat tie uh, when you look at the uh, percentage of error. There's always a margin of two to three percent error there. Uh, so we're in essentially a dead heat tie. So it's any man's game. And uh, hopefully at the end of the day, um, I know we all feel like this. Uh, Mitt Romney will succeed and become our wait next president. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Let's just stop this madness now before it gets out of control. Leave it to Jim and throw it in there. You know, on the sly. I mean, Jay Real. <laughs> <laughs> you you had to sneak it in. Didn't you? you know, it was, I was going to sneak it in, man. I got to. I got to. We, we're trying to uh, bring on a new era that uh, is not uh, socialism based. So. You seriously <laughs> think that Mitt Romney is going to do a better job? He's going to turn all this around. Mitt. Um, uh, again, I'll say this about Mitt. Here's what I, I know Mitt's not going to do. Okay. And this is what's important to me. Um, what's important to me and what he's not going to do is he's not going to submit program after program after program after program that does nothing but expand governmental uh, control over um, our lives. That's what I know uh, he's not going to do. And for on that reason alone, I would rather see him in the office than President Obama because what you have to remember at the end of the day, I don't care what policies and uh, plans uh, President Obama put in place. Um, ultimately, well, he's going to leave office, and somebody's going to have to pay for that. And he can preach all he wants for his four years that he won't raise taxes on the middle class, but he will not be president forever. And eventually, someone else will become president, and eventually, the bills are going to mount, and taxes are going to have to be raised not only on just the rich but on the middle class and on everybody else because that's the only way you're going to continue funding uh, a large massive government and so yes on that reason alone I would rather see Mitt Romney as president as opposed to uh, President Obama but I hear we have a caller on the phone how you doing caller God bless you, and good evening. Stay blessed and prosper, my good friend. Oh, I appreciate it. You do the same. And your name? Well, uh, I'm Reverend Dr. Chocolate Hot Mess, two T's and two Z's. Oh. And I want to share a special natural stroke strategy of the Obama campaign. Next week, when T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen are here, 
the wives will be gathering at the African American owned Double Tree Resort. 1,100 rooms on 28 flush tropical acres, they will be putting forth a platform to nominate Hillary Clinton as the vice presidential running mate for President Barack Obama. Secondarily, they will be also putting into nomination Michelle Obama as uh, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. Thirdly, um, uh, Mr. Obama will agree tacitly that he will resign his office at the end of his third year. Thus, automatically, Hillary will become the first woman president in history. And because she is also known as a presidential designee in training, a president in waiting, she will be treated very differently. And she will re re command a level of respect and authority that is heretofore unprecedented. And then, during her, camp during her administration, she will elevate Michelle Obama to Secretary of State, giving her both domestic and foreign experiential capabilities, at which point Michelle then becomes the nominee for the Democratic Party at the end of Hillary's seven-year term. Oh, hold on. And you uh, now have an exclusive. Uh, just one, one second here, one second here, one second here. Uh, Reverend Hot Chocolate Mess, is that what you said? Reverend Dr. Bishop Chocolate Hot Mess. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, uh, well, we, we appreciate. It's not a joking matter, my friend. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's a, it I'm not. It's a political, practical reality. There is not a, there would not be a slate imaginable that could conquest it. The woman's vote will determine this election, and with that master stroke, the woman's vote is locked and loaded, buddy. All right. Let me tell you something. All right. We, we, we appreciate your call, man. Of Obama Clinton nest. All right, we we appreciate uh, we appreciate his call. Um, you can call too four zero seven eight nine four sixteen eighty four zero seven eight nine four sixteen eighty. Um, I don't even know what to say right now. <laughs> I know what to say. It was a hot mess. <laughs> what? <laughs> it was a hot mess. <laughs> he had something to say and he got it off his chest. So we, 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 we thank do, you for the call, sir. We thank you for the call. We do appreciate everyone that does call into the show and join the family. So we thank you too. Uh, the good Reverend Doctor uh, Hot Chocolate Mess, Doctor Bishop, Doctor Bishop. Bishop. Okay, Doctor <laughs> Bishop, uh, Reverend Bishop. I think it was. Mess. Well, a whew, what a way to open up the show tonight, huh? <laughs> it will be a good show. That, that's letting you know that <laughs> it certainly, it certainly will be. Um, I have. Um, so anyway, I, I'll move on. I, I know. Uh, well, I know my uh, my good friend here, Rob. I know he uh, he's not again like like myself. He's not the biggest. Mitt Romney supporter, but uh, he at least rather would see uh, Mitt Romney in office over uh, President Obama, um, and probably for some of the same reasons I say and others. Uh, but um, so, so I know at least one other person in the room uh, agrees with me that uh, there are better options. Because, like, like I said, to, for me, this is not about this is not about him. This is about long term future. And, I don't, you know, he can put all the policies in place and, and the Democrats can get control and they can sign all of these things. They can start making the rich pay more in taxes today. Um, but you have to remember the presidents, um, the country, I'm sorry, not over when President Obama leaves office. The country is still going on. And so whatever programs are in place, they're going to have to be paid for. They're going to cause the government to get larger and he may be able to get taxes raised today, but trust me, as soon as they get power, the Republicans again, they will be pushing back all of these raised taxes. And so again, it's going to fall on the country. And that's whether regardless of how much money you make to pay these things back. So rather than create programs that need to be paid back, cut programs that can reduce the size of the government and everybody uh, can begin keeping more of their income long term. And that, to me, is a better long term solution uh, than than doing all of this stuff to appease people and make them feel happy for the moment uh, without and thinking that you can just make the rich pay for everything. And that solves all of our problems <coughs> uh, mentality. Uh, and uh, move on from there. Clearly, yes. clearly, even his own party doesn't believe that. When you see the other day that they they had an issue with the Buffett rule, I'm gonna have and, to uh, I'm gonna have to say something because you, you, you keep on <laughs> rambling about about this, and I, I, I'm not I'm not too happy about you talking about 
You know, nothing that, you know, nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. But what was the topic for the day? Uh, we'll, we'll move on. All right. Fine. Was, the, it you, isn't you're, the topic. So yeah. you're a lawyer, right? I am a lawyer. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we'll move on. I do have one other comment before we get to uh, the Trayvon stuff. Jeremy, I put up on, on the screen there uh, some comments um, that were made by um, leading by the name of Hillary Rosen. Uh, could you just kind of read that back for me, uh, Jeremy? Uh, he's he's checking it. Well, here's the gist of it. Um, what she what she said is she implied that. Uh, well, let me give you the I guess the background. Mitt Romney, of course, like we know, is running for president. One of the things he's been saying is that he looks to his wife for advice about what women are concerned about. Um, he says that his wife said women are concerned about the economy, um, and so Hillary Rosen uh, was commenting on on his comment and suggested that because his wife um, is a stay-at-home mom, uh, essentially what would she know about an economy? You know, she's just at home taking care of her kids, not to mention um, she suggested that, you know, she's never worked a day in her life for that matter. So what would she know about women's concerns as it relates to the economy? And I really wanted to kind of gauge uh, the women's point of view on that as far as so if you're a single home, uh, single, I'm sorry, if you are not single, but if you're a stay at home mom, um, you know, taking care of the family, you know, she, they had five sons. Uh, so that's quite a large family that they have. Um, so if that's your job to be a stay at home mom, is it conceivable that you would have no understanding of the economy to, to be concerned about the economic policy of the country? I don't, I wouldn't say necessarily that she's completely out of touch. I think that there are some, to some degree, she does have um, access and knowledge to some information. However, she may not necessarily understand the idea of being laid off. She doesn't understand the pressures of working in an environment where people are concerned about their livelihood. She may not necessarily understand those aspects. Um, but I wouldn't say she completely doesn't understand because she does take care of certain elements and I don't know to what degree she does but she you know does have some communication with her husband I'm sure with some things that are going on either with their home although they are quite wealthy um, but there everyone in this economy has been touched to some degree so I think she may have a maybe a small understanding but not a complete understanding of the stress that many other middle class and, and, and otherwise individuals may experience. Yeah, and I think that's the point that the, the Ms. Rawson was trying to make. It's like you can't speak for the everyday people. Y'all are extremely wealthy. So your hard day might be, oh, we're a couple of million short, as opposed to only hundreds in the bank for some people. So I, I get where she is. It, I, it wasn't so much a diss on um, women and taking care of children and, and that saying that that's not a job because that's that's a whole different issue. Mm -hmm. I think from her position, her sp her perspective is completely different. She's a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. So even with her raising her children, we don't know, but I assume they had nannies and housekeepers and, and uh, help that mm -hmm. the everyday person does not have yeah, with five managers. children. Right. Yeah, house managers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> house managers. They go house, grocery shopping for house manager. <laughs> well, well, she managed a small economy then. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, did, I, I, did you want to come in here? You can j just jump in there. Um, regarding the Rosen comment, uh, based on what I saw, uh, and, and again, it's, it, it's very li limited, but I took it more as, as an insult to a stay-at-home mom in general. I think there's a lot of people who may not have uh, as much, inf uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but a lot of people who would not uh, not be as qualified to comment on the economy as her. Uh, I don't think the fact that she's a stay-at-home mom should be uh, the, the sole qualifying factor of whether or not you're qualified to speak on the economy. There's a lot of people on both sides of the aisle, both Democrat and Republican or multimillionaires. You know, Ted Kennedy for years spoke for the poor, but his family was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, they owned 40% of their stock in oil. I mean, you, you go through the facts and, you know, it's the money alone shouldn't be, or, or whether or not your stay at home mom shouldn't be a qualifying or disqualifying factors to whether or not you are, um, you're qualified to speak on the economy. And, and, and I do agree with what you guys are saying. You know, some people can't, you know, when you're multimillionaire, you may not feel the same effects during a, a down economy, which I do agree. 
but I, I I still think the 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 innuendo was kind of off base, being that she's a stay at home mom. I mean, it should have been focused on, you know, um, you are, you're you know, rich, you're so you're rich. What do you know? Not exactly. you're a stay at home mom. What do you know? Right, right, and and, and I think I think ultimately. Um, you know, it's my opinion that that's probably what she was intending to say. Mm -hmm. But of course, you, you can't just go on television and say you're rich. So you don't know what I'm talking about. Of right. course, people would consider that politically uh, incorrect. Uh, but uh, but but yeah, you're right. I, I think the, the overall gist of what the comments were, were out of touch. Um, a lot of times, you know, especially with stay at home moms and, you, you, you know, you have a, a man that's basically working all the time. A lot of times that stay at home mom now also becomes the manager of whatever finances are coming in because you're you're off busy trying to figure out how to make you know, that extra million dollars for that week or, or whatever it is that you're chasing, you know. Um, and so, you know, so I think in, in a large part that stay-at-home mom does actually know a lot about the economy in terms of how to spend money because, you know, rich people are rich not because they make sometimes a million dollars a year. It's because they budget it and they only spent $200,000 a year. Um, and so, so a lot of that does play into understanding how the economy works so that you keep a budget and you're not overextending yourself. Uh, so, so I think, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said, sure, between the rich and the poor, but there's, there's also aspects that are the same. Um, and so, you know, to criticize stay-at-home moms, which is what she said anyway, um, was certainly definitely out of touch. Uh, but we'll move on uh, from that as well. I'm just curious what the ladies thought. Um, if you want to chime in real quick, uh, even in the midst of our, uh, our conversation tonight, feel free again, 407-894-1680, 1680. Uh, but we'll go on to our main topic tonight. Uh, so George Zimmerman uh, has been charged and arrested. And, uh, and so here we go. Uh, the, the first ball or the first shot or however you want to, you want to call it has been played or shot or made, I guess. So we will see uh, what happens next. But what I wanted to do is kind of start with breaking down what it means to be charged uh, with second degree murder. What is it to be charged with second degree murder? What is uh, second degree murder? So that's where I want to start, um, which is one of the reasons why I brought Rob in the building. So if Rob, you, you'll start us there. What is second degree murder? What does that mean? All right, second degree murder uh, historically is what they call a depraved heart murder. Um, as you'll see, I've given you guys the, uh, the, the the statutes. It's under Florida Florida chapter 782, um, which is defined as a, as a homicide, uh, the homicide statute. The second degree murder is considered the unlawful killing of a human being when perpetrated by an act imminently dangerous to another and evincing a depraved mind reckless of uh, regardless of human life. So that depraved mind, that depraved heart is where they get the term depraved heart murder. So uh, premeditation is not an, an, an element. And, and I just want to preface that again, I, I'm not an expert in criminal law. Um, I, I have very limited experience in criminal law, but I, I do have access to a, a lot of the other, um, I mean, not just the statutes as we all would, but, but some of the case law. And, and I pulled up one of the cases, uh, this is uh, State v. Montgomery, and it gets a little bit more into detail on what second-degree murder and the elements that have to be proved uh, in second-degree murder. Again, as we all know, the, the burden for a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, so it's a very high burden, um, as we're all familiar with in Casey Anthony, unfortunately. Um, but second-degree murder is an all unlawful killing perpetrated by any act imminently dangerous to another and evincing uh, depraved heart, uh, as I stated earlier. And con it comes down to what is imminently dangerous to another and evincing a depraved mind. And the Supreme Court of Florida has adopted the following, uh, the following rule, which for the first element is a person of ordinary judgment would know that what they're doing is reasonably certain to kill or to do serious bodily injury to another. The second element is it's done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent. And the third element is, that, uh, is of such nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. So in, in layman's terms, the way my, one of my professors in law school explained it to me, and it was a great way, way to look at it, is if you're driving through a neighborhood and you know that someone's in a house and you, uh, you take a shotgun and shoot into that house, you're not intending to kill anyone. You're just intending to scare them or be, you're, it, it, that's the depraved heart. Because you know that if someone is in that house and, that, and, the, and, and the buckshot or the bullet goes through that house, get hit and kill someone, you know that, that that's a distinct uh, 
possibility. That's a depraved heart uh, murder. That, that, that's a, the example that most people would give for depraved heart murder. Is if, if you know someone is in an area and you shoot into a car, even though you're not trying to kill them, you're trying to injure them, but you know that there's a good chance you could hurt them or kill them. That, that's typically, and, and a murder uh, results from that, that would be a, the, the typical um, or the, the model uh, second degree murder. Okay. All right. So, so there we are. That that's by definition, by law, that's what second degree murder is. So then the next question becomes, um, and and again, we're we're speculating. We're we're all not lawyers here or experts in criminal defense, but I'll just say based on the the things that we have heard, mm-hmm. um, and uh, at least according to what we've been told, are true. Uh, the question becomes: Does this sound? like something that uh, equates to second degree murder. Um, I'll offer an opinion first. Um, and uh, you like that, don't you, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. King? Um, it's your show. <laughs> um, and, and so when, when, I, when I read something like that and I consider the, the facts and the circumstances of this particular case, to me, and, and I've done a lot of, uh, I've done some reading and there's a lot of lawyers out there that agree that this does this does not seem like a second degree murder case. Um, second degree murder seems to be uh, a bit of a stretch to prove that you know these three things that that were outlined by Rob here: the person of ordinary judgment would reasonably uh, certain to kill or do serious bodily injury, uh, done from ill will. Uh, hatred, spite, or evil intent, uh, such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. Um, I don't see any of this stuff uh, valid in the circumstances of this uh, particular case, at least from what we have been told. Um, and, and I find it interesting that they go here. Um, you know, I add on to the fact that the, the prosecutor of this case, uh, while she was, she came on to the case late, um, you know, add into the fact that who she is, um, which is a, um, a black woman. Um, I added to that. I, I, I think you can't separate that from, from her perspective on this case. Um, I add into the fact of the high profile nature that this case has become um, in the country um, and, and where it is and kind of where racial tensions are. I think those things, while, while they tell us, you know, we, we don't, you know, par, uh, play into political pressure. Um, you know, when you're an elected official, which she is, you know, I find it hard to believe that political pressure doesn't play a role um, into your thought process. Um, and so I, it just feels like this case is being overreached based on these particular set of ideals. Um, I'll let anybody else chime in if they like. I, I think to some degree they do. I don't know if he um, meets all three, but from what I have read with the transcript that he had with the dispatcher, um, with his statement of these individuals get away with this all the time, with the fact that she had asked him, you know, did you leave or, you know, you're not supposed to go and get him, did you go get him? Um, Now the indifference to human life, that I I don't know, because we weren't there when he went to go reach the gun, reach for the gun. So I don't know if we could necessarily, or they could necessarily prove that, but I think that the first two um, are pretty obvious, that he did plan to do some type of bodily injury, and that he did have some ill will or he never would have gotten a a gun. Um, Or, you know, he would had some type of evil intent, per se. Um, So. I don't know if if they would necessarily be able to do all three, but I think that there's evidence towards majority. At of least them. the first two. Yeah, she the said. first two. Yeah. Um, before let anybody else talks, uh, just remember you can join these conversations 407-894-1680, 407-894-1680. Anybody else who's going to chime in or? No, we're all going. If, if if you don't mind, you know one of the things I, I remember speaking with my wife about this when it first happened and. And, and as I've had time to sit back and, you know, it's it's kind of weird. Once you start working as an attorney, you try to deal in facts as much as you can. And it almost, you know, my, my wife will swear that I never had common sense. But I, since I've become an attorney, I've lost common sense because everything you deal with is in facts. When you first saw this on the news, my first thing is, why, why wasn't he arrested? And, you know, and, and that was my honest first thing. It seems like something was wrong. And as you go back and you find the facts out, and, and again, the prosecutors, they have a lot more facts than we do. You know, they, they, they're going to be privy to information that we just may not be privy to or that gets thrown out there. So I, I really don't know. 
I mean, like when I, when I look at this, it's like, you know, you go back and forth depending on what news station you were, you watch. And I would be dead honest. I mean, you know, in the morning I get up, I'll watch Fox News, and I also watch MSNBC Morning Joe. I actually prefer to watch that. I, I'm more conservative, but it's a, it's a liberal talk show, but it's actually a very good show. It's very well done. And depending on what show you watch, you get different viewpoints. And the, the, the same statements, the same facts are twisted in different ways. So I, I really don't know what I believe, to, to be honest with you. You know, I mean, it's, and, and, and I'm being dead honest, you know, when it, it would be great if we all had the facts in front of us 100%. But, you know, some of my witnesses or ear, ear witnesses, it seems, come out later, go on both sides. And, and some are back in George Zimmerman and some are back in Trayvon Martin. Is that politically driven, or is that, are they truly 100% of what, what they heard? And these are things that I, I think we don't have 100% access to. You know, and in the charging document that the prosecutor gave out that the, um, the affidavit of probable cause, which you have to do to have a, an arrest warrant, um, you know, they had a lot of sworn statements from police officers and stuff in there, which I didn't even know about, you, you know, st st stating some of the things that led to probable cause for his arrest for the charge of second degree murder. So, I mean, it's, it seems like every day there's something else coming out that it's, it's kind of sways you either way. Do you, do, what, what is the definition of manslaughter? Manslaughter, um, I get, we also have a printout here. Um, manslaughter is typically, you know, we hear the term in some states, or like if you watch TV shows, negligent homicide. It's uh, the killing of a human being by act, procurement, or culpable negligence of another without lawful justification according to the provisions of Chapter 776, which by, we'll get into later is the Stand Your Ground Law. Mm -hmm. So basically what it's saying is it, it's, it's negligence. Uh, you have a duty to, to someone to act in a particular manner. You breach that duty, and as a result of you breaching that duty, you, you killed them. That, that's the damages. There's typically four elements to negligence, five depending on if you're a law school professor. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, the bottom line is you have a duty, he, he had a duty to, to act responsibly as, as a gun owner is the way I would interpret it. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, I, I'm not a prosecutor, so don't, you, you know, take, take it for what it's worth. Um, but then he breached that duty by maybe not using it in the proper way. He, he, he wasn't in imminent harm. Uh, he, he had no reason to, to take the gun out. And then by a result of him using the gun, he, he, he killed uh, Trayvon. And when, when you look at a case like this, um, you know, I, I, as I'm looking at it, it's almost like Casey Anthony as well. And, and I, I hate to even bring that, that into it, but in Casey Anthony, they overcharged. You know, if you talk to a, any attorney, they say they overcharged. They, they, they didn't have the evidence for first-degree murder, but it, it was a political stunt. And then they turn around because they didn't get the lesser conviction of, of, of manslaughter, nor, nor do they have a jury instruction on it. She wasn't convicted on, on anything. And, and that's one of the things that I fear with this. I mean, we don't know what the facts are. Now, maybe the prosecutor does have it. We, we really don't know all the facts they have. But if you, the, the, the manslaughter is a lot easier to convict on because it's, it's just, it's a lot easier to, to, to prove then. I mean, how do you prove you have an evil intent? Now, now you start getting, you know, premeditation, first degree murder, contrary to what people think, except the obvious, obvious cases, are very difficult to prove. I mean, it's it, premeditation. You have to get inside the head of the individual and prove intent. But they do have that on record, like, as Ms. Marco right. was saying. They have them saying, he's not going to, I'm not, not going to let another one get away. Uh, you know, he, mm -hmm. he said a lot of things that's Correct. on tape. So, mm -hmm. I mean, which one would you think would stick more? The you know what? I, I and again, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, manslaughter seems like to me. Again, looking at it objectively, it looks like it would be a home run. Uh, right. it, it does. Second degree murder. Like I said, d seriously, depending on the day or who you listen to, based, and, and I try to get all the facts, and I, it, it's tough. I mean, it, it's it's tough to get unspun facts. You know, I mean, I was watching mm -hmm. NBC one day, and they and they played a, a part of the uh, the tape, and. Um, they had, he said, there's a man in my neighborhood, and she's like, uh, okay, don't approach him. And then they have him say, it looks like he's black. But they, if you listen to the unedited version, the 901 dispatcher says, That's, what does he look, or, you, you know, what is he, he black, like? white, or Hispanic? Well, he looks like he's black. Right. So, you know, like when we don't know, and this is what it, it gets to me because it's, I, I stopped following it after a while, the, the factual, because I, I could never get the, the real right. facts up. There, there's so much, there's so much spin uh, in this case that you don't really know what the truth is. Which is what, a shame. What, what, which is a shame. But one of the things I look at um, is, one, when it comes to, you know, this, this whole idea that obviously, um, do I think it was racial profiling? Definitely. Mm -hmm. It was definitely racial profiling. Um, but what you have to remember, if we're honest with ourselves, we all racial profile. So so there's nothing, there's nothing evil about his intent there because if it was i mean just 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 walking down the street um you know and you see a group of 
and this this could be any males for that for that matter depending on what they're dressed like you're going to make an assumption about what their intentions could be simply based on how they dress regardless of what their color is mm -hmm. um and and in a general sense um there is a general fear uh you know of young black males that exists in this country and that's regardless of whether or not you are uh whatever spectrum you're on that that exists um and so 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 the, the, the racial profiling thing, um, I give them a pass on because it's natural. It's a natural thing. Everybody has it, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, black people, racial profile all the time um, in, in our natural. We, we Obviously, we don't necessarily react in the same way, but we, we do it all the time. Um, and so, so you, you, I give them a pass on that, um, even though I do believe it. Then I listen to at least what people say his character is. Um, at least from his character, if he does the things that they say he has done, uh, which a lot of it, you know, has to do with uh, helping young minorities uh, with the studies and things of that nature. To me, that takes away that that whole um, overt racism card. But, um, but this isn't his first incident in, of this nature, though. Well, well, hold on. Let me finish here. And, and I'll address that, too, since you brought it up. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and so and so uh, so. So, so, you know, that whole overt racism, I at least pull it back off the table because if he's as racist as we say he is, there's no way in the world he would have tutored young minority children. It wouldn't happen because a true racist isn't even going to associate with minority children. You know what I'm saying? So, so the racist element that we're putting on him does not exist to the level that we have suggested it has. Uh, so whatever level it is or isn't, you know, it's certainly not what we've made it out to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then to his past incidents, essentially what his past incidents say about him is he's a hothead and he has a temper issue. Um, but for all indications. So that just um, goes against everything that you just said. Because if, no, you're, if you're a hothead and you have temperament issues in the past and now in the present, it's the same exact thing. I, I, There's I a mean, difference I, I, in being a hothead and being um, an absolute racist, though. Because you can be a hothead um, in situations, right? Um, I know individuals who are hotheads just because if you say the wrong thing to them, they're going to say the wrong, you know, they're going to get on you. But that doesn't make them a racist. That just makes them have bad attitudes. And so certainly he could have fallen into this category. But, but just to be devil's advocate, um, how do we know that, you know, Trayvon Martin wasn't a hothead as well? And, and we have a situation where we had two hotheads that came into contact with each other and there was a bad result. So be, because there's so many, again, unknowns, you know, and she says she has a lot more facts, um, I find that truly hard to believe in, in this case right here. But, but uh, more concrete facts, I find that truly hard to believe that they have solid concrete facts that can verify and prove that he is the, the racist that they say he is, that he hates uh, blacks the way they say he does, and that his intent that night um, was in part to shoot whoever he thought was doing something evil. I, I think that's going to be hard to prove. But the video um, proves that. If, if, if on tape you're saying he, the, another one is not going to get away, what else kind of proof do I need when you're verbally saying this and I have it recorded and video and, you know, so, uh, uh, audio is, is more proof than what you really need unless you were right there seeing it. Now, I, I, that I, doesn't equate to killing. That equates to making sure I'm going to watch him, but that doesn't equate to I'm going to kill him. Because let's be honest. There are a lot in the state of Florida. Anybody who takes the proper class and passes the background check can go and get a concealed weapons license. And anybody who goes and takes that class, trust me, is packing all the time. I have a, I have a friend of mine who has taken that class. He's packing all the time. When he goes to the grocery store, he's packing. When he has his four-year-old and his two-year-old in the car, he is packing. <laughs> okay? He is packing all the time. That's why these people have the license, because they want the right to be able to carry their gun at all times, as long as it's concealed, and if the situation arises, protect themselves. It has nothing to do with their intent when they go to the grocery store. It, it has to do with their right because they own this license, because they've taken this class, because they passed this background check to carry this gun. It has nothing to do with intent. Um, I see we have a caller. Uh, caller? Oh, he's still there on? Hello? Hello? 
Yes, God bless you and good evening. Oh, God bless you and good evening to you. Your name, sir? Um, my name is irrelevant, but what is important is that last night's NAACP executive and membership committee meeting resolved to present to the national organization several frames of reference and calls for action. Number one, Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman is the canary in the mine. George Zimmerman did not set out that evening to kill a black man. In fact, when the facts are all known, Mr. Zimmerman may have been just as afraid and frightened for himself as was Mr. Martin because Mr. Zimmerman was overzealous and unfortunately there was, as someone said, a very bad result which was not intended. But that is totally irrelevant to the issue at hand at the mass slaughter of young black males in this country in a pervasive pandemic that is causing us to reach a point where we are inflamed at every level at the lack of community services. That is so total, true. At a total lack of educational and digital opportunity, at the, the toxics that are in our community, that all of the indices of the worst things that can happen to humanity are all lodged in the African and Caribbean American communities. However, there is a resolution, and that first will be congressional hearings throughout the nation to define the scope of the problem and to document many other instances so that we understand that this is in fact a statistical pandemic and then we but develop what, what the programmatic strategies to change and to challenge it and to challenge it at its roots through programming initiatives that are in the community All right, that are I, not a part of the all right, thank you, sir. We appreciate it. We appreciate I, it. I understand what he's saying, but I, I really don't understand how just documenting documents will actually change something. Well, it, well, here's what I have to say, because that's another issue that's been raised about all of this, is we're making this big fuss about this particular case when the real problem in the world um, is black-on-black -black crime. And, and here's my opinion on black-on-black -black crime. Um, a lot of people are, are suggesting, you know, some kind of congressional hearings and and you know things need to be said from a federal perspective, uh, but but let's be honest, um, the government doesn't solve our problems. They don't. They they typically when they do step in, they add to the problem because now you have to go through this step, this step, this step, this step, and then you can get to a potential solution that probably has two more steps that need to be regulated before you can get to a real solution. So the solution of black on black crime is not a government problem. It is a black America problem. And until black America within our own uh, to me, you start, you know, our, our foundation as, as blacks in this country typically starts with church. Um, and so to me, that's where you start. You start with a church that has the ability to go into the neighborhoods who can form coalitions with other churches to go into neighborhoods and really start some type of initiative, you know, with the young people of that neighborhood and, and kind of work your way through the generation or work your way through as they go up and that's how you attack that problem it's not a it's not a government problem it'll never be solved by the government and us sitting back waiting on the government to do anything is is, a, is us allowing the problem to continue that problem will not stop until us as a community find a way to get together as a community and solve that issue you know, that's when that issue will be solved, just like all the numerous issues uh, that exist in black America today. When black America sits down at the table with each other mm -hmm. and stop running away from each other um, and, and, and work together, when that's when you'll see changes in black America. And that's and why that's, we, that's and why that's we have Obama. And that's why we, <laughs> well, Obama's not up there with his brother. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> he may be there in spirit, but he's certainly not there in the work. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, but that that that's going to take local. That's going to take local. That's going to take local communities uh, working together and figuring these solutions out. Um, and, and and you know, before we move too far from this, I, again, I want to thank that brother. I believe that was the Reverend Doctor Hot Chocolate Mess on the phone again. Bishop, so, Bishop. Reverend so, Bishop. Uh, so we, we we really do appreciate his enthusiasm this evening. I love it. Thank, uh, you, for but, uh, thank you for calling. Thank you for calling. But thank you for calling. Uh, remember, you can call to uh, 407-894-1680, 407-894-1680. Uh, but back to the, the topic yeah. here. I do have a question, though. Yeah. So, now, in your opinion, does Zimmerman have a, a, a stand-your-ground uh, 
what do you think about that? Because that is his defense. Yeah. Well, that is not necessarily his defense. According to his lawyer, that is something that they will be exploring, but they haven't decided that is his defense. They could very well uh, use, I guess, a, a regular self-defense charge or self-defense as his, uh, you know, his defense and, and, and go up against this second-degree murder charge in and of itself. He hasn't settled on actually using the stand your ground law, according to his lawyer. What other law would you use in Florida? Well, I mean, self defense. I mean, that's a law. That's that's a defense. Self defense. I felt threatened, or, or whatever the case may be, and I had to defend myself. That's 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 a defense. That's not a law. That's just a defense. But you were going to speak on the stand by stand your ground. It's okay. Uh, the the stand your ground it, it, that that's covered under uh, chapter 776 of the Florida statutes it's 776 section 3 it says a person who's not engaged in unlawful activity and who is attacked in any other place where he or she has a right to be has no duty to retreat and has the right to stand his or her ground and meet force with force including deadly force if he or she reasonably reasonably believes it is necessary to do so to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself when you look at this, the, the thing that sticks out to me, and, and th this is where when I, you know, when, when you called me last night, Jimmy, I was up doing research on this stuff, even at work today a little bit. So uh, if the people from my office are listening, I, I didn't mean to slack too much, but I, I was going to that. <laughs> um, and, and it was amazing. The more you delve into this, the more, uh, more it, can op it opens a can of worms because the first thing that sticks out in my mind looking at this, and, and I'm curious, and this is maybe something that the prosecutor would attack if they use as a defense as a person who is not engaged in an unlawful activity. The question is, did George Zimmerman do anything that was unlawful in, in approaching him? Uh, what, could, could anything he did be considered an assault? Because as soon as you initiate, a lot of times that kind of negates some of these defenses. And, right. and that's what I'm saying with the facts. And, 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 I have, I, and I admit I'm guilty. I don't know enough of the facts to know it. But that's one of the things that jumps out to me. I, I mean, if you look at this, if, if what you hear on some stations that, you know, after he confronted him, that, you know, Trayvon was on top of him and beating him up, and he did it to get him off him, and, and if he really believed, and this is where the law gets weird, because did he believe he was in fear, uh, of, in, dying. In fear of dying? But or, but it also says force with force. Right, exactly. So, I mean, ma mainly you would probably have to, the other person would have to have a gun or some form of a weapon. And that's, you know, and it's, they, they wouldn't have to have a weapon, but you, you have to be in fear that you're going to die or that you're in, in imminent harm of, of, of immediate danger. I mean, I'm what's the language here? I mean, I'm sorry, I just uh, I lost my spot on this. But you want to make sure that you, you you can't just go out there and if you say okay someone punched me in the face I pulled a gun and shoot him that, that's not what the stand your ground law right. says you know it's it, it, you have to be in in fear for your life or of, of very severe danger uh, okay I mean and so that's the, the those are the things that pop out to me you know what a reasonable person which is always a standard in this case mm -hmm. which is it's that's why it always goes to a jury because what's a reasonable person no one really knows you but know? it, but it also says on the video that um, that they told him not to approach the general yeah, correct so right. now if, if you're telling me not to approach him and I still mm -hmm. approach him am I able to use the stand your ground or in your opinion and, I know. And, yeah and, and that's what I'm saying you know this that that's where th there seems to be like a minute overlay there that no one knows what happened. And, mm -hmm. and, and if they said don't approach him, and he approached him anyway. You know, we don't know if he pulled a gun out at that point. We don't know what happened. You know, that that's where there's no, th th there's like a minute overlay there, if I remember correctly, that, that we don't know what happened. And, and that's where I think it all, all comes down. I mean, if he went, walked over and he was like, hey, get out of here, puts that? his hand on him, and he initiates, what's that? No. Oh. And, and he initiates the contact. I, and. And it could be considered an assault. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, he's not, it's not acting in self-defense. Right. You know, so there's, but at the same time, when he's on the ground and he's getting beaten up, that could be self-defense. So that's. In, and also in the videos, when he went to jail, they zoomed in and showed no mm -hmm. scratches, no bloody nose. Well, see, that's, that's another uh, falsehood because it was later proved that there were um, like um, gash on gashes ears. on the back of his head. That, that could be seen once you cleared up the video. That's why That's why when you get into, um, and, and I see you have a comment you want to make, Brandon, and, and, and I'll say this and I'll let you comment. Um, that's when you really get into what is the truth. You know, the thing about this case, it, it's like you say, you go, you, gotta, you go back to Casey Anthony because it's, it's not about what we perceive to be the truth is, and, and a lot of people's opinion is just that. It's the perception of what the truth is. When you go back to the facts, the facts of this case, um, or I should say the, the lack of facts in this case, at least from what we can see, um, at least prove that there doesn't seem to be a clear line of 
what happened that evening. It, it doesn't seem to exist in what we know at this point. Uh, now, clearly, like, like uh, Rob was saying, you know, perhaps the prosecutor um, has access to evidence that we don't have. Um, oh, I'm, I, I should say, I know she has access to evidence that we don't have. Um, and so maybe once she begins to present her case, she's going to show us things that we weren't aware of. But just generally speaking, from the information that has came out from the, the supposed eyewitnesses, um, the, the biggest thing that I notice about the eyewitnesses is that it amazes me that nobody's on the same page, but everybody's an eyewitness, you know? And, and I believe, uh, you know, you try and believe that if they say they were there, they were there. So if you were there, how is it that you are on this end of the spectrum and you are on that end of the spectrum in the same situation? It just doesn't add up. Um, but go ahead, Brandon. What's your comment? Um, I had a question for uh, Mr. Robert over yeah. here. Um, in your opinion, because I know you, you're not a judge and, mm -hmm. and this ain't an actual court case, um, Mr. Zimmerman's uh, failure, failure to comply to the command of the officer, could that be considered uh, obstruction of justice and could that disqualify him from standing, to stand your ground law? That, you know, I, I don't know if obstruction of justice would be the term um, because it was a 911 dispatcher, but my, I, I think there's something to that and that's what I was trying to allude to for and you bring up a great point because yeah, I mean, when you look at it, the first sentence it starts, a person who is not engaged in an unlawful activity. You know, that's, that, that's a key because we don't know, and, and again, the, the, based on what I've seen, there's like a minute overlay there that we don't know what happened. And, I mean, if he, in fact, approached him, if he pulled out a gun, you know, if he put his hand on his shoulder, all of a sudden that becomes assault, potentially. It becomes a battery. Well, now that's unlawful activity. So if Trayvon Martin turns around and punches him or does something to get him off him, then it turns into a scuffle. You know, even if he doesn't punch, he just pulls away and George Zimmerman, you know, and this is speculation. Well, yeah, you could make a strong argument that now it becomes, you know, assault, a battery, and, and now it's not lawful activity. Now it's unlawful. So, you know, that's, you know, the stand your ground, you know, when, when you read it, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't read the stand your ground law until yesterday, and the first thing that jumps out is not engaging in unlawful activity. Activity. If anything he was doing was unlawful, you know, whether it be an assault or battery, that may negate that. And, and again, this is what I was saying. I, I looked yesterday and you start researching and it opens a can of worms of all these different possibilities. And, th and there's other defenses avail available as well. And it's just, it's, it, it, it's really out there. But yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And it, it's, it's very possible. It wasn't lawful activity what he was doing. And then, I mean, I guess the facts show what, that he, he'd made 40 some odd calls in similar situations in the past. You know, and that could be interpreted two different ways. But I mean, obviously, he does his stuff on a regular. You know, he was doing it on a regular basis. I mean, the the facts are pretty clear on that. And it's, it's 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 just kind of, it's kind of a shame. I mean, because when you look at it, the bottom line, you have a 17 year old who's dead. Right. I mean, that's that, that's the biggest thing. I think we lose sight of sometimes in this. You know, it it turns into a race issue, and this guy, but the, this kid's dead, which is the biggest travesty in the whole thing. I think the race issue is just the blind side because it's it's really not a race issue in my opinion. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times. Uh, you know, no offense, but a lot of black people want to use the race card just to to justify a lot of things they go wrong. And, and, and really, I don't think it's a race issue because this man was Puerto Rican. You know, well, he was Hispanic. Let's not say right. Puerto Rican. But uh, I, I really don't think it was a racial thing. Mm -hmm. I really think it was like, you know, if you're in the military, they teach you how to use a weapon and you don't get to use it. Eventually, you're going to want to use it, mm -hmm. you know, until you get that chance. And like you say, he made 40 something odd calls. And like he said on the tape, this one will not get away. So that's why I feel like it was kind of meditated. Now, I, I mean, it's easy to put a gash in the back of somebody's head if I want to make a defense. I've, I've, I've been chilling for a good, what, month or two, you know, making a defense because I knew eventually I was going to get arrested. That's just me, and I ain't shot nobody, you know, but that's just <laughs> thoughtful planning. Just like if I get the gun, I'm going to think, okay, if I'm going to use my gun, this is what I'm going to do. If I have to ever use it, this is what I'm going to say. If I ever have to use it, I'd have made 40-something odd calls, so I'm guessing I'm going to use it one day. I mean, it's easy to defend yourself when somebody is dead dead and you alive and you killed him. It's just my opinion, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. I hear you. Remember, you can join in these calls, uh, I mean, these conversations, 407-894-1680, 407-894-1680. You know, speaking of, of this particular law, uh, of course, this case has really brought this particular law to the forefront of everybody's mind. This, this law has actually been in existence for approximately seven or eight years now. Um, I have a question, you know, even beyond this case. What, what do you guys think about what do you guys think about this law? Is this a law that you feel like should be in the books or is this a law that they really shouldn't have gotten there that somehow slipped through the cracks? Uh, but but it doesn't seem to be necessary. Any opinions about that? And, and this is beyond 
you know, whether or not, you know, George Zimmerman uses this as a defense, because mm -hmm. right now that's the biggest reason why people have a problem with this law is because it's potentially going to be used to defend his, you know, killing of a, a 17 year old. But even, you know, beyond George Zimmerman, um, like I said, this law has been here for almost eight years. So just what do you think about the law? That's the question I want to answer. I don't think there's anything wrong with the the law in itself. I think the problem is, uh, like uh, Rob was saying, it, 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 at this point it's too vague. You know, there's no clear-cut definitions of, there's no clear-cut definitions of things. It's just, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's no, no ifs. ifs it's, it's too, it leaves too much to question. You know, so so um, I mean, you any good lawyer can throw this to throw something to a jury and swear them either way because you know they they're not really averse to the uh, the legal system like that. So they can just make them feel like oh, they was a threat of their life. They shot them. Okay, it's all good. The law says you can shoot them. They're good. I mean, but like you were saying, it has to be no lawful or. Something about lawful, right, uh, Rob? Yeah, yeah. A, a person who is not engaged in lawful activity and who is attacked by uh, in any other place where he or she has a right to be. Right. I, I, I'm in agreement with it. I mean, as long as you're doing everything that abides by the law and you defend yourself and you shoot somebody and you done did everything you had to do according to the law, then, yeah, I mean, you should be able to use this. But like I said, in his case, the police told him not to engage leave the man alone don't follow him and then you did therefore you did not follow what the law told you to do so you should not be able to use this law i agree with a lot to a degree um the problem that i have in section three is in any other place whether it's appropriate in home protection yes i mean if you come in my house it's on you know, especially if it's an unlawful activity. <laughs> um, but it, any other place just leaves it to any type of situation where someone could get away with, just like, you know, we're talking about here, in any other place. It shouldn't be that broad. It should be more specific as to um, where you are protected in, within the law. I think they give you that. When you, when you get a license, I think they kind of give you a... Uh, some kind of uh, stipulations about using your weapon also in mm -hmm. public um, you can't take it into I think federal buildings or government buildings or something to that nature you can't have one in the club or it's certain laws that they give you when you mm -hmm. get your license to have a weapon also but could they therefore use it if in this any other place let's say they felt threatened for their lives in the elevator of a governmental building you can't Could even you say I was in any other place I was going up the elevator and someone attacked me so I shot them like, I, I think it leaves too much gray area. If they had a weapon, if he had a, a bat or a pole or something to that nature, I would be able to shoot yeah. them, correct? Correct. Well, well you see, no, you, you've brought up a great point in the elevator in a federal building. That would technically would be unlawful activity. Ah, uh, okay. Because so you're not allowed okay. to have it. There's a law that you're not allowed to have in a federal building. Right. Now you're violating okay. the law. But okay. I, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, but yeah, I mean, if, if you have a bat and you're coming at him with a bat and you have a gun, yeah, you, you defend yourself. You I mean, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Now, if you don't have a weapon, as Trayvon did not have a weapon, mm -hmm. and then you shoot, that person now now it's a problem now i need to check out some things i have to do some detective work mm -hmm. but like you say if, I, if you in my house oh you did <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it also leads to a question and i know this is years ago when i saw this law so it may not even be active but the 10 25 life rule or law whatever happened to that like if if you have a gun you automatically get 10 years if you use it it's 25 if someone dies it's life like did that just dissipate or it's just the no longer was created and to replace <laughs> it <laughs> i'm still there but then eight years later stand your ground came about and then we started using that one that's you know there's I, I couldn't tell you there's a lot of minimum mandatories in Florida um, well one of the neat neat things I mean and I mean this is something anyone could do I, I got all these things all these statutes other than the one uh, Supreme Court case I gave you you can get access to Florida's legislature's web, web page of Florida statutes um, mm -hmm. and it's uh, leg.state.fl.us and you could pull up all these um, all, all these statutes I know I said can that real quick again? yeah, yeah I don't say that. it's uh, <laughs> www.leg.state dot fl dot us and you, you it gives all the florida statutes and the uh the title what is it uh xl if you want i'm sorry i haven't done roman numerals in a while but uh they there's a whole section uh titled crimes and that goes through all the crimes and and they go through justifiable uh 
defenses, justifiable, justifiable homicides, the, the first, second, third degree murder, uh, manslaughter, aggravated manslaughter. Like, I mean, every single crime you could imagine. And cert, you know, as you had said, if certain crimes are committed while you know, uh, while trafficking substances, for example, as something that came across la last night, those things are get multipliers on your sentencing. We have like a mm -hmm. score sheet now in Florida, and that determines um, uh, your your sentencing and, and how many years you get. And there's certain aggravating factors. So if, if you commit a crime with a gun, it adds a certain amount of points to the system, which increases the number the amount of time you spend in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, as does you know, if something is if you're trafficking cocaine versus trafficking marijuana versus I mean, there's all these different multipliers and different things that go. Go into the uh, I, I, as, you, as you were saying to go into uh, sentencing. So off subject, I find it kind of is, is it true that you go to jail longer for trafficking marijuana than cocaine? Oh, I don't know. I there, there's a lot. Every state's different on that. I couldn't tell you. Oh, it's a good good question. I just, that's just <laughs> situation. What was your question? Uh, is it true that you go to jail longer for trafficking marijuana versus cocaine? Because oh. different um, people that I know that they know people. They uh they went to jail for you know marijuana for years, but then other people that know people that know people went to jail for cocaine. It was three years, maybe four years. That was it. I, I know in New York when when you do it, I, I came down from New York, and uh, unfortunately I had a friend who went to jail for something like that. But uh, it, it doesn't go to so much the substance, but the amounts. Mm -hmm. Like you know, you, you an ounce of cocaine may get you minimum mandatory of ten years, where it may take you five pounds of marijuana to do the same thing. But you know, some people may be more likely to have five pounds of marijuana than an ounce of cocaine. So right. they so it, it's not just the it's not just the drug but maybe the amounts and I don't know how Florida is I, I don't even want to speculate on that I, I probably should know that but I, I don't but I know in New York it was purely based on weight so <laughs> again if you if you work with him and you're listening just <laughs> you're still working hard <laughs> uh, well well you know um, and, and we're winding down here uh, to the close of the show um, and so. In, in summary, here's what I'll say. Um, one, let's, let's realize, um, I hope everybody knows uh, that is going to be following this case. Uh, realize that this case is going to take some time uh, to, uh, to come to not only a conclusion, but just to come to trial um, in and of itself. Um, you know, the, what's going on this week, uh, I believe they're trying to have a bail hearing from him on Friday, but they're already talking about the judge stepping down tomorrow and recusing herself. Uh, due to um, the fact that her husband works for a law firm in which he sought counsel to potentially represent him. Uh, so we're already moving on to a new lawyer. Um, again, a bail hearing is potentially set for Friday. Um, there's probably going to be tons of motions, tons of discovery. And so it will more than likely be sometime in 2013 before we even see the trial begin. Um, and then um, and, and then, you know, the trial itself may last for a few months. So so we're far from a conclusion. Um, you know, I, I'm, I've gone on record several times. I, I think second degree, first degree. Um, is is an overreach by by the defense uh, sorry by the prosecution, um, and and I even read that this particular um, prosecutor has a tendency to kind of overreach on some of her uh, charges, and and I think going for the the gold medal in this case um, could potentially prove um, in losing uh, the race here, and uh, that would be unfortunate uh, when you can easily get someone on something to at least hold them accountable uh which is what i think you know one of, you know I, I, one of the comments i remember the mother made this week and, and i know she clarified her statement but but she said you know that george Zimmer made an accident you know and, and i think ultimately that's where we are we're, we're at we're at a place where this this man made an accident i don't think he intended to kill anybody um, I don't. I, I do think he intended to at least maybe confront him to find out and verify that he should be there. But I think murder was never at the front of his mind. Killing this young man was never at the front of his mind, and it was an accident that happened. And and unfortunately, sometimes we do go to jail for accidentally killing people. Um, you know, it's a part of the law. And so so for that, yes, he should serve time. But but to go for the gusto, uh, which I believe. Um, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the maximum sentence he's looking at here is probably life for second uh, degree murder. For second correct. degree murder, he's probably looking what at what about life. manslaughter? Manslaughter is uh, this five to twenty five, I believe. I saw when I was looking at it last night. I think it's five to twenty five for manslaughter. So, so we're going for life here when we can at least get you know ten, ten, ten yeah. you know something. Maybe twenty five. Maybe twenty five. Um, you know, and, and it still it still holds someone accountable, which is what we're talking about. 
holding someone accountable uh, for this murder. And that's that's at the end of the day, that's the goal. And whatever tool you need to do to accomplish that, in my opinion, is what should be done. Um, and, and I see that they're, they're telling me here we're about to, uh, to go off the air. So um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I wanted to give uh, Monica and Rob an opportunity to quickly go ahead and shout out your businesses again. Absolutely. If you're looking for premarital, um, marriage counseling, family counseling, or individual counseling, you can contact the Covenant Counseling Center at 321-872-7720. And I work with uh, Effort and Associates, the number is 407-244-1980. We do uh, a lot of un unpaid wage claims, uh, personal injury, and PIP law. All right, we appreciate that. And uh, remember, we'll be here next week, Tuesday, 9 p.m. Um, you, go, you can go to the YouTube page and catch all the shows and listen to them again if you so desire. That's YouTube.com, uh, and the channel name is Real Family Talk. Also, check out the Twitter, Real Family Talk. Check out the Facebook page, Real Family Talk. This is your host, Jay Real, and uh, we will see you again next week, 9 p.m. Thank Vote you. Obama. Vote Obama. <laughs>